I'm going to start with the scripture. And we're just going to see where it goes. Isaiah chapter 38. This is in the midst of um, war. In those days, Hezekiah was sick and near death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, went to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed to the Lord and said, Remember now, O Lord, I pray, how I have walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. And the word of the Lord came to Isaiah, saying, Go and tell Hezekiah, Thus says the Lord, the God of David your father, I have heard your prayer, and I have seen your tears. Surely I will add to your days fifteen years, and I will deliver you in this city from the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city. Um, there's a lot going on right now. And it would be very easy to become fearful by the circumstances. You know, Hezekiah was, um, he was sick, but he was also the king. And what would happen when a king died was, it wasn't just, it's not just his life that was, that was at risk here. It was his reign, it was his house, it was his people. He was a descendant of David. It was the throne that God had established. It was, it was a sickness that was much more than a life at stake. It was a nation. Um, because Assyria was, it had the power in this, in this particular moment. Assyria, the enemy, had the upper hand. And the nation and the throne, the line of David, was sick. God sent the word that he was sick and dying. God's desire is for his people to prosper. God's desire is for his house to reign. His desire is for his church, his bride, to sit on the throne in his world. But there is absolutely a battle. There is an enemy, and he's not weak. Hezekiah turned towards the wall and he cried out to God. And God responded quickly. I see this ministry. I see you guys. I can tell the difference even from when I was here six months ago. I can feel it. I can feel the hunger. I, I messaged Letitia this morning because I was just I was sitting on my bed just praying. And I could feel the pull. I could feel the intercession. I can feel that this is a ministry that has turned your face to the wall and wept bitterly Come on. on behalf of the yeah. sick yeah. and dying nation. Jesus. God is so cool. Mm. He takes us on <laughs> such incredible adventures when we'll go. Um... We ended up in uh, Kansas City last week, and um, Darla and I, and my husband, and our family, and uh, we went to the International House of Prayer, which is an incredible place, and we've gone there uh, multiple times and just received so much. And we were there, and there was a little flyer on a counter inside the welcome just it was a just an unassuming little flyer you know so and so pastor seven or six thirty whatever wednesday night and darla said you know she's jumping out to me i'm gonna go and we were like all right we'll go too and you know we go in it's a divine appointment god had sent us there we met this guy and uh he was commissioned by god he was originally from malta and then he um he had moved to the United States for Brownsville and um, had lived here for 15 years. He was commissioned to start a house of prayer in Iraq. And he's been there for three and a half years. He and there are four families. They have, um, I think, 13 kids between the four of them raising their children in Iraq with a house of prayer there. I mean, within just miles of ISIS and all the things that have been going on. Um, 
And we, we got to become, you know, meet this man and kind of share stories with him. And he ended up coming and uh, visiting with us in Conway. And he, he sat us down. We, we had dinner with him. And he showed us these videos of these um, Iranians being baptized. In Iran, if you profess Jesus, do you lose your head? I mean, it's their government. It's against the law. You can't, you can't proclaim Christianity. It is against the law to do that. And I'm watching these baptisms of these, um, these Iranian people. And I've been to a lot of baptisms. Um, a lot. I've seen literally dozens of people baptized. Some of which I knew really got it, and some of which I wasn't sure if they did or not. Because you can get baptized in the United States of America, and it doesn't really cost you anything. You know, I mean, you're you're making a proclamation that people celebrate. But I'm watching these Iranian people, and, and um, Fabian, the, the man that we met, he told us a story about this one man and his family. He was he was from Iran, and when his family found out that he was professing uh, faith in Christ actually locked him in his house and kept him there for 30 days. And he actually escaped to make it back to these people in his house of prayer. Wow. And then she showed me this man's baptism and it just hit me so hard. Right now our nation is sick. Yeah, yeah. And people are playing games yeah. getting baptized for no reason other than it's something good to do. There is a cost, but in the season it's found at the altar. It's not one that's found in the everyday walk. My husband and I, in 2013, we were uh, we were at a different church, and we were in youth ministry, and uh, he spent a week at uh, the the teenage youth camp, and he came home. He's exhausted. I mean, he probably slept like two hours every night. You know, just. You know, if you've ever done youth ministry for very long and you've done anything like a camp, I mean, it's spiritually draining because you're really, you know, you're really ministering a lot, but it's also, I mean, you're just exhausted because you're not 16, you know, like, it's hard to keep up. <laughs> so, he came home just worn completely out and completely spiritually drained. And I remember in the, you know, the wake of this camp, he and I sat on our bed in our bedroom and we had just been talking about following Jesus. And we loved the Lord. I mean, really. It was that was our life. We were in ministry, you know, we were raising our children in church, and we were doing what the typical American Christian does. We were volunteering a lot. We were um, you know, we read our Bible, we prayed. And I remember this conversation. And I don't remember everything that led up to it, but there's this one part that I'll never forget, ever. And I was like, I think it's really time for us to be radical. And he was like, yeah, let's do it. I had no idea at all, like at all, what we were saying. We had absolutely no idea. But like I said earlier, God purposes things in our heart before we have any idea what it's actually going to cost us. He purposes these things in our heart. He purposed a radical life of following him in our heart. And I mean, we thought, you know, we'd just volunteer another service. We're going to be wild, you know? Like, we didn't know what it looked like. He turned our life completely upside down. And by that, I'm not meaning that in like a, a, oh, that's cute sense. I mean, like, completely upside down. Um, Within six months from that, we lived in a different town. We were, um, a tornado came through and um, just completely wrecked anything that we stood on. Uh, We, we... One of my very close friends lost her children in a tornado. My husband was one of the first people to respond, actually found her children. Um, I wrote an article about it. It went viral. Millions of people read it. I'm talking, when I say God turned our life upside down, I mean everything that we knew within a year of making that statement. I want to be radical for you, Jesus. Everything was different. Everything we lived somewhere else. We went to a different church. We found out that so many of the things we believed were um, not the full truth. We learned what worship was. 
that it wasn't just a few rehearsed songs, that it was a live prostrate before the Lord. We learned all these things, and I tell you this because I want you to know my heart. Because God has called me to say hard things. He really has. But I promise you, there are lessons that I have learned and that I have counted the cost to be able to say. We're a strange bunch. <laughs> when we go places, people kind of look at us funny. Because we have all these long-haired men and all these tattoos and all this stuff that just doesn't make any sense. And we're not welcome a lot of places. I didn't know what a Nazarite was when I asked God to be radical. But in case you don't know what a Nazarite is, I'll refresh you. Throughout history, God has called people to set a standard. He has called people to be set apart and to be consecrated. He's called people to live holy. And when his people and his nation and Israel was in trouble, God raised up Nazarites. He raised up the consecrated ones. Samson was a Nazarite. He's probably the most well-known. But whenever you study, you also find out that John the Baptist was a Nazarite. A Nazarite did not drink anything, any wine. They did not consume any fruit from the vine. Which in that day was like saying, I won't eat fast food. It, was, um, it wasn't a matter of taking a stand against alcohol. It was a matter of taking a stand against something that was completely okay socially. Um, they could not be around death at all. Which meant if their mother died, they couldn't go to her funeral. And they grew their hair. They didn't cut their hair. In a time where man buns were not cool. <laughs> they were set apart. They were strange people. But they held a standard in it. Amos chapter 2. God says to Israel in this warning, He said, I gave you Nazarites. I raised up some of your sons as Nazarites. And I raised up some of your sons as prophets. And he says, but you gave the Nazarites wine to drink and you told the prophets, do not prophesy. Mm -hmm. In the very next chapter, it says that God does not move without first telling his prophets. And then in the next chapter, he begins to list off the judgment that he has given to them. And he says that I gave you cleanliness of teeth. I gave you pestilence. I gave you illness. He gave these things to them out of his mercy. We are not supposed to be afraid when we see God's judgment coming on this nation because it is sick. And just like he sent the prophet to tell Hezekiah, you are sick, get your house in order. God knew when he sent that prophet that Hezekiah had a choice to respond he knew that Hezekiah had a choice to cry out, to accept it, or to turn from God. Because he could have just said, oh, I'm sick, I'm dying, I love you, Lord, I'm dying. Or he could have just said, curse you, God, that you would let me die. But instead, he turned to the wall. He turned to the wall. And he said, remember, that I have walked in your ways. Remember that I have lived set apart. God began to speak a message to me at the beginning of this year. I've shared it multiple times, but I find it very profound and I find it very important for a time like this and for a people who have chosen to set themselves facing a wall and crying out to God. A Nazarite the picture of their strength is their hair. Now a modern day Nazarite might not necessarily throw their hair out, or they might as a prophetic act. But their strength is their hair. It shows their strength. Samson couldn't cut his hair because God commanded him to wear his strength visibly. There's a picture in the New Testament of a woman named Mary who sat at Jesus' feet. 
and she washed his feet with her hair and her tears. God is calling for a people right now who will weep bitterly over the sickness of their nation. Who will set their hearts to him. He's calling for a people to live set apart. He is raising a standard of voices. Yes. Not echoes. Right. Yeah. 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 But most importantly, and he says this, when discussing Mary, he says that what she did should be shared anywhere the gospel is shared. Was that she sat at his feet and with her strength she washed his feet. Do you know that he told his disciples when you go in and they reject you, dust off your feet. Don't carry that rejection with you. What did she wash off of his feet but the rejection of this world. She took it into her strength. She was mocked by the religious Pharisee who was hosting them and the disciples that loved Jesus. You will not be understood when the nation is sick and you face the wall. Everyone is going to say, do something. They want to see fear on you because it justifies the fear in them. We have to rejoice at the state of this nation. Because whenever God sets out His diamonds to shine like the stars, like a jeweler, He lays down a black cloth so they might shine brighter. We won't be lost in this season. Because light and darkness can be seen a very far away. But there's a cost. Will you stand to be peculiar? God showed me when I was at IHOP, I had this vision of sitting um, and praying. And I saw um, walking through a crowd, and they were turning. And all of a sudden, this large question mark like formed on them. And God said, that those who are willing in this season to make people wonder, those people will be driven to the altar by the puzzle of you. And as they seek to solve it, they will find him. Are you willing to be peculiar? Are you willing to say you won't touch dead things? Are you willing to say that you won't go to the dead places when he says don't go there? Because you can't find the living among the dead. You might hurt somebody's feelings. You might hurt somebody's feelings. There's no obligation greater than the vow of the consecrated ones in this season. There's no relationship greater than the vow made to God a covenant. If we are a remnant that's chosen in this season, you have to be at the altar. You have to be at His feet. I was standing in worship a few weeks ago. It's the strangest thing. I've never experienced anything like it before. I lifted my hands up just in praise and I had this feeling all of a sudden of of being lifted up. It was such a split second. Um, It was was so in the spirit I didn't even really process it in my mind. It bypassed it. And I had this feeling of being lifted up like as if into God the Father's lap. Just instantly. Just in a second. And I felt my spirit just leap. Yes, let me go there. But then all of a sudden I wasn't there. I was was just standing with my arms raised. And my favorite place, I love the altar. I love to be at the altar. But I was standing there. And all of a sudden I was so wildly disappointed. Because it wasn't his lap. And as consecrated as the altar is here and ours, this this is only just a floor in a building. And I was still standing there. 
And all of a sudden I understood what Paul meant when he said to live as Christ. Because I would so much rather be there. I would so much rather be genuinely at his feet with my eyes, my natural eyes upon him, washing his feet with my hair, but instead he asks me to walk that out as an expression in a broken world. We are mistaken when we live as if the cost of discipleship is giving up our sin. What are your R-rated movies at the cross? What is your gossip conversation at the cross? What is your weak faith at the cross? What is your unbelief and your doubt? What is your fear? What is your poverty mentality? What is your alcohol? What is your compromise? And rest assured, we live in a nation that though God has raised up Nazarites to set a standard and prophets to set a warning, they have fed the Nazarites compromise. They have given them wine and told the prophets to sit down. Mm. <coughs> and here is the church walking proud because they are good. Please understand, Jesus did not die to make bad men good. He died to make dead men live. What message does it give the broken when we say, well, Jesus spread his blood, so you don't have to do that anymore. Jesus shed his blood so that we would have the grace to walk in holiness so that we can face a wall. It doesn't make any sense to be a puzzling and peculiar people in a broken and dying world. To set ourselves apart, not for a show, but for the wall. The miracles, the wonders, the words of knowledge, the gifts of the Spirit, all those things, they flow out of the altar. They flow out of intimacy. They fed 5,000 with fishes and loaves, and Jesus did not say, this should be shared everywhere my gospel is shared. But a woman, a broken woman, took the very best she had and poured it on his feet and was mocked and ridiculed by not just the enemy, but by his people too. And that's what he wanted shared. This is important. The pressure is on. The nation is sick. The enemy has the upper hand, it would seem. But there is one. That's right, yep. And there are Nazarites who will say, I don't want your wine. And there are prophets who will say, I will not sit down. Mm -hmm. oh, and the choice is right now to count the cost. The choice is right now not to build a ministry for your name. God does not call us to preach. He calls us to follow. He found them with their nets and said, lie them down and follow me. He found them in their tax booths and said, come away from it and follow me. He did not walk up to their boat and say, I've got a good message for you and you're going to do a really good job. You're going to be a really big deal. He called them away. He said, follow. Yes. There is one calling in Jesus it is to follow. Right. Yes. Hallelujah. Oh, and there's the grace to do it. There is the grace to follow. There is the grace to preach. There is the grace to perform miracles. And it ruins you if you are facing anywhere but the wall with your heart prostrate before it. Let me tell you, 
you count the cost. You say, I want to be radical. And the very first cost is he like, says, oh yeah, you really want to do that? And you stick it out. You know what comes next? That's when the counterfeit blessings come. I want to share a little of my own testimony and I hope at this point you know my heart. I've had some really good offers. I got to go to this really cool thing. Um, they flew us in an airplane. They put us in a hotel that cost $1,000 a night. Guys, I was raised up a very poor girl. And for a poor, a poor girl to get gift cards and new shoes and $100 sunglasses, I remember sitting on this hotel bed with all this stuff poured out in front of me. But then we went to the meeting and a girl stood up and she gave this prophetic word and nobody really knew what it was because nobody really knew the Holy Spirit that much. And I felt the Spirit of God move and I felt that prophecy. And I started to watch it my spirit started to race. I stood up because I couldn't sit down in this auditorium with 2,500 people. I felt the Spirit of God move. And then we broke went to dinner because we had reservations and everybody ordered their wine with their steak. It was a very nice dinner. I got some really pretty shoes. I could chase that world. But God, give me the altar instead. Yes. We test the spirits on those offers. Once you make the choice to stand up, and once to make you make the choice to be radical, and once you stick with it, when your world falls apart, crumbles around your ears, yep. you test the spirits on those offers. Yep. If he can't get you off track with sin, he'll get you off track with the good stuff. can't pimp out your gifts. Oh, come on now. Come on now. Thank you, Jesus. There's a problem with this sick nation and this sick church. There's a problem. Because it's a body. This is the body of Christ. And there are people that are standing up proclaiming to be the body of Christ. And running it like a business. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And what is a body when it becomes a business? There's a reason why Revelation talks about the bride and the harlot. Yeah. It's not talking about the church and the world, as you might suppose. It's talking about the bride and the religious system. You have to test the spirits. Yes. Yes. You have to be willing to be peculiar. You have to be willing to set at his feet and be mocked. You have to be willing to stand up for your call and to worship. You have to stop lamenting how good you are, how hard it is. You know why there's so many angry holiness preachers? Because they think that's what's saving them. There's nothing angry about being holy. Praise God. Do you remember what it was like to be in sin? It was awful. It was miserable. Highs and lows. Feeling so lost. We praise God that He took us out of that. We don't act like we did something for Him. I think that's what time it is. (laughs) 
we're going to do some altar ministry. Um, if my my dear Nazarites would come up here, you guys, the ones that came to minister. There's a call that's being raised. I feel like there are a lot of people in this room that have probably been doing this and not even 100% sure what you're doing. You've been asked, like you've had a question, and you've been pressing in, God, solve this for me. Why am I living like this? What is, what is it that you're calling me to? And you feel that burning to holiness. You feel that, that burning at the altar. You are burning ones, I know. I felt it today when I sat in my bedroom that I was being pulled on that God was being pulled on through me. I felt it. That I was coming into a place where people have set themselves facing the wall and weeping bitterly for the state of this nation. Desperate for God to move. Not trying to own it. I brought some of the most prophetic people I knew because I wanted you guys to get fed. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Because I feel the preciousness in this room. I got to come on New Year's and I felt the hunger and I felt the glory of God. And I truly believe that anytime someone comes into the presence of God with expectancy, He doesn't send us away. Amen. When we ask for bread, he doesn't give us a seat. We make war with the prophecies that are spoken over us. You know that why, why that woman was able to just wash his feet with her tears? Because she understood the depth of his love for her. She knew his voice. He hadn't even died for her yet. She didn't even have the understanding that we have. She didn't have the resurrection. But she knew who he was. And she knew what he had said. And it was worth the very best she had. It was worth being mocked. And it was worth taking his rejection into her strength. Because his forgiveness was great. And tonight I would like to equip this body with more prophetic words to fight with as you stand home and all for this nation. With your tool in one hand and your weapon in the other. Father God, I just ask that we might hang new weapons on the belts of these beautiful and precious people. God, that you're raising them up for such a time as this. To take on your heart, God, even if it means we can bitterly. To take on your heart, even if it means turning away very attractive offers. God, that will follow, that will kill the cost of follow when it isn't glamorous and when the diagnosis is bad. Would you just like to be prayed for if you will come up? my brother and I've asked him to share uh, some testimony because I feel that there are um, there are people in this room that are standing on the wall for people who are in a drug addiction and that are pulling for particular people and there is a spirit of prophecy on testimony we overcome by the blood of the land and the lamb and the word of our testimony and God is not a respecter of persons. If he did it for us, he'll do it for you. And so I want to put this, this testimony, this prophecy in your hand to wage war with. So that you can say you did it for them. Now do it for me. Because I know there are people in here that are standing on the wall. And you are pulling people into the kingdom from drug addiction. So I'd like Josh to share with you. Thank you. 
Well, um, seven years ago, I was a youth minister at a local church, and I was married. I sang the songs, I prayed, I read my Bible, but uh, my life and its fruit was that of the flesh because I was seeking the flesh. And the Lord, when I was 27, uh, gave me over as to my sin as an act of love and discipline because I wasn't listening to him. I was ignoring him. I was looking the other way and thinking, oh, I, I go to church. I, I, I give offering. I have a nice house. I have all these things. I'm living the life that I'm supposed to live. When in reality, like it speaks in the epistles, multiple letters, talks about the fruits of the flesh, anger, strife, all of these fruits were manifesting in my life. And so I divorced my wife, sold our house, um, left my career and became a bartender because I wanted to live a single, fun life. I was tired of being bogged down by rules. And I had a, a standard that I felt I was living by. I still felt like I was this good person. I just was given a raw deal. And the cards that were dealt to me, I've done the best I could. And in reality, I was selfish. I was seeking myself and, and wanting to gratify myself. And that's where it always starts. That's where it always starts. It always begins with self-seeking and seeking the flesh. And as that continues in your life, what will happen is four years later, I am an alcoholic and addicted to cocaine. Doing cocaine three or four times a week, drinking six nights a week, waking up the next morning, which morning to me would have been one or two in the afternoon, and doing it all over again. And feeling that that was fulfillment. Lord, continuously tried to reach down and say, have you had enough? Is this enough? And I was stubborn. And I continued and continued to move down that path. And I feel the reason why the Spirit moved Jessica to ask me to give my testimony is because it's a, it's a testimony of victory. Only nine months ago, in October, nine or ten months ago, in the middle of October, I was still doing cocaine, still drinking, still I have, through, during that span of rebellion, I have two children from two different women. I completely, from the world's standpoint, wrecked my life. And a lot would think would be un unredeemable. And one night after waking up in a ditch, with blood on my knees and my left right elbow being rained on, on John Barrow. And the night before I was just in West Little Rock and having no idea where my car was, my wallet, my phone, or what I had done the night before. I walk into my mother's house and all of my family is sitting there. And I, my first response was, I'm not having it. Effing come to Jesus moment. That's exactly what I said. Yeah. And my brother, who I love dearly, said, you already came to Jesus. I'm just here to remind you. Oh. And I, I received complete deliverance. All the, the spirits that were operating and oppressing me were cast out. I have not touched alcohol. I have not touched drugs. I have not stepped in a bar. I have been passionately and running after Jesus Christ in a way that looks crazy to most people, but I'm always reminded of the 
parable that Jesus spoke about the two servants. It was the king and the two servants. And one owed 50 and one owed 500. I believe those were the numbers. If not, it doesn't matter. There was a large discrepancy between the amounts. And he forgave them both. And Jesus asked his disciples, which do you think loves me more? Much is forgiven. For those that are forgiven much, love much. And I love Jesus Christ. And I want to encourage you that the oppression, if you are suffering from that oppressing spirit that speaks to you about rejection, you're not good enough, yeah. seeking yourself, yeah. there is deliverance in the spirit of Jesus Christ. Amen. The power of Jesus Christ brings deliverance. His Holy Spirit Amen. can deliver you from that. You are strong enough. Here's my younger brother. Uh, I'm Jeremiah. I'm Jessica's husband. This is my older brother, Josh, and my other brother, Paul. And I have a lot of family. There's my kids in my family. But uh, I want to add on to this because um, we're going to declare and decree some things. I want to just show you that there's more to that testimony than just that. Because you're sitting in here, whereas he was not sitting in the church that I went to. He was not sitting under Darla. He was sitting at a bar. Okay, so you're sitting here. So I want to give you the testimony of what happens when you sit here and you stay submitted and you stay facing the wall and you decree a thing and you don't let Satan tell you otherwise. Okay, so here's what happened is that God pulled me out of rehearsed church and put me in, well, as we call it, and this is not like I'm not, it just pulled me out of that. And he put me into what we call church as intended, which was God, you have your way. And whatever that looks like is what we do. And, you know, I have come to like that. And it was a little, I'm just saying, it was a little rough at first. But I was by myself, and every single family member thought we were nuts. I mean, I thought I was nuts, so I couldn't really blame them. Um, but they, they were not having it. They were not visiting. They were not talking about what was going on. Like, it wasn't happening. And I'm talking the second service. Uh, Darla gets up and says, there's a break here, there's anointing. Get up here, we're breaking chains, and declare your family is coming in. I said, okay. I said, let's do that. I didn't know what I was doing, but I did it. And I claimed every single family member. I spoke their name out, and I declared it, but I believed it. And I had the faith that God deposited in me to, to watch it come to fruition. All right, so let's fast forward a little bit. So my 16-year-old brother, who, when I got filled with the Spirit, moved out of my house because I was crazy, he comes back to my house. And he's like, well, there's something going on. And on New Year's Eve of that year, he starts praying in tongues and prophesied to Darla. I'm talking before, I mean, like, I mean, he just went. And he's 16, and now he's 17, and I'm right now, he can stand up here and preach. Like, filled with power. Like, he, so he came, and he's an ordained minister at our church. He's gone through the class. So then... My sister, who's Michaela, and she was living in a life of sin of uh, multiple relationships and different things and running from God and, and, and saying out a hold of her, just invited her to church one day. And she came, got set free, got prophesied to, running for the Lord right now. So, okay, now there's, now there's two. Okay, but we're still the minority. But I didn't, I didn't know. No, seriously, my family, too, is the minority. Okay? So that wasn't enough. So we kept praying. My mom came and visited. She said, that was fun, and we were crazy. <laughs> well, she came back, and she came back, and then God got a hold of her. Oh, now we're three. Now I've got three. I'm like, all right, God, well, that's not what we said. I said, you said I could have my family. You said that I walk in the mantle of Joseph, and Joseph saved his entire family, not just part of them. So I said, okay, Satan, you can't have the rest. I was like, bring them in, God, in your timing, right? In your timing. That was important. But then we started getting prophetic words, and he started telling us who was coming next. He started telling me that, Paul, Paul, where are you at? Okay, Paul was in drugs and lost, living in Oklahoma. Satan had all kinds of things on him. Okay, he had not slept peacefully in years. Shows up at my house high on drugs. I'm talking high, high. Like, doesn't remember, okay? But he, he came to my house and he slept 
peacefully that night. And that was enough because of the consecration at my house. Because I would not allow, I would not allow, because of my authority in my home, anything that would be able to have a foothold, he was able to come and sleep peacefully. And that was enough for him to finally ask a question and be like, what is going on here? And I'm like, well, Jesus is going on here. And it's not like Jesus has before when I told you about Jesus. It's like real Jesus. It's like, this is the real encounter of Jesus, not where we just talk about it, where he actually encounters you. And he's like, okay, I want that. Deliverance. Okay? Now, Paul is set free, on fire, walking for the Lord with the goods on Satan. All right, so now, okay, now we're gaining some momentum. I'm like, about even right now. I've still got a bunch of people lost. Well, then my sister comes in out of the Navy. She's an alcoholic, or she was. And she comes home from the Navy, but she, the Lord's been working on her in her isolation. And she comes in, and she's the hungriest of all of us. I mean, she just hits the altar and just starts crying like God just speaks to her, and she gets set free. And then I hear that my brother Josh is coming, and I'm like, all right, God. It's like, me and Joshua were close. And as close as we were before, we were just as far away in, the, in his rebellion. He hated me because I was the religious one. Like, I'm the one who had Jesus, so he did not like me. We called him secret agent, man, because we never knew what he was doing or what was real. Because he was so bound up in demons. I'm saying he was so bound up in demons, he didn't even tell the truth about anything. Like, honestly. He was so ostracized from the family because he just isolated himself. And God told me that Josh was coming in, and I'm like, that's a big order. I was like, there's a lot that has to happen. And God's like, was my hand not far enough? Does it have, not have the reach? I said, yeah, it has the reach. And he said, okay, well, then God bring him in. We have... We have guests over at our house. We're playing games and having fun, and I get a phone call. Uh, Josh woke up in a ditch, covered in blood. Doesn't remember what happened last night. Uh, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not telling him. No, we're like, yeah. I don't. We're not telling them that you guys are coming. We just want you to be in the house when we get back with them because we're going to get them. So I'm like, okay, Paul, you coming? Yeah, I'm coming. All right, Jessica, let's go. And we go and sit in the house and wait. And like he said, he walks in the door. I ain't having a coming to Jesus moment. I'm like, oh, you already came to Jesus, brother. That's like, you're coming back to Jesus. It's okay. And then, and then as we start deliverance, he just starts confessing. And it, literally, with his mouth, he said, I don't even know why I'm telling you all this. I was like, because the Holy Spirit is coming inside you and it's casting everything out. All right? And the fruit. Okay, so now, right now, we are nine kids with a mom and dad who've been married from day one until now. And the only people left is one brother who lives in Oklahoma City and one sister and my dad. We are the majority in a year. Okay, so we declare a thing and within a year, I'm the majority. So I make a joke in my house all the time. They don't stand a chance. It's like, because if God can work through me to bring in that many off of one person, those two with us in agreement have no chance of not finding God. They have no chance of not coming in. They have no chance of not getting set free. No chance. Okay, because we will declare it and decree it until God does it because he said it was so. And he knows all things. If he sees all time, he knows that it will come. Are we going to have the faith until it happens? Again, yeah, because honestly, I had a, I mean, I, you know what I'm saying? I could see Paul because I knew Paul's heart. And I could see these other, but, but the thing that spoke to me the most, that God will do everything that he says, is when Josh came in. And our relationship was restored. And not even restored, it was sent back to a place that it never had been. Woo. See, because this is what our relationship was intended to be, but see, it was attacked from the, from the beginning. Right. You say, well, where there was strife, there was no strife. I say, well, there was anger. There is now no anger at all. Like, we're as, we're as strong as it can be as brothers. Okay, and I have that relationship now with most of my family. So what I'm, say, I'm saying that to say this, if you have family that are not walking with God, if you have family that are in drugs, it, it doesn't even matter what they're in. If you will decree, declare, and walk it out in faith, in God's timing, you will see every Woo! single one standing in this church. And don't look at you and say, I don't know why I'm saying all this stuff. It's because of the Holy Spirit, but they don't have to know that. It's okay. It's going to happen. And I'm telling you that I, my family, has to the testimony to impart and to tell you that it will happen. It's not something that I can talk about as if it might happen. I know it will happen because you're seeing it. I have one, two, three, four, five, six family members here right now in your church right now. Like, and that's not even all. I still have more. 
And so I want to stand and pray with you guys. Actually, I just want to pray right now and decree over your families a, break, a, a, a breaking of chains. So God, right now, we just we just call forth the Holy Spirit, God, to break chains. If you will do it for me, you will do it for them. If you'll do it for me, you'll do it for anyone, God. So we break the chains off of their family members, God, off of their sons, off of their daughters, off of their brothers, off of their mothers, off of their, off of their fathers, grandparents. It does not matter. His reach is not short. It is long. It is far. It is it is all encompassing. And so, God, we thank you that you will pull them out of the miry mud, God. That you will enter their minds while they're eating the pig slot, God. And they will stand up and think, wow, my father's house is better than this. A servant in my father's house eats better than this. And they will start making the journey back home. God, because a true prodigal, a true prodigal knows the father's house, leaves it and comes back. So, God, we just call back the true prodigals right now, God, to get their full inheritance, God. Their full inheritance, a ring and a cloak and a party. And, God, right now I declare over this entire body, God, that they will not be the other brother, God. They will not be the other brother that had a problem with their brother coming home. That they were upset about their brother coming home, God. But that they will be, the, the, that they will be excited and participate in the party that is coming for these people. light of the party that's coming for these for these people God and we thank you that we know that you will do it God in Jesus name